Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Monty Hart Lecture Series. It's a great pleasure to have today two speakers instead of one. We're trying something a little bit new. We have today Dr. Andreas Kumar and Dr. Rohan Dharma Kumar, who will be presenting the Canadian Cardiovascular Society classification of acute myocardial infarction, this new classification based on stages of severity of tissue injury that they recently published on the European Heart Journal. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to have them here today. As a brief introduction, Dr. Dharma Kumar uh, earned his Bachelor of Science in Physics and Physiology and Master of Science in Mathematics and PhD in Medical Biophysics from the University of Toronto. He received postdoctoral training in cardiovascular MRI at the University of Toronto and then Northwestern University. In 2006, he joined the faculty of the Department of Radiology at Northwestern and was recruited to Cedar sinai in 2011 as associate professor when we originally met. There, he held various leadership roles at the Biomedical Imaging Research Institute, including Associate Director, Director of Translational Cardiac Imaging Research, and finally Co-Director of the PET-MRI Research, a role he held until uh, since uh, 2014. In, in 2018, he was promoted to Professor in the Department of Biomedical Sciences at Cedar sinai and Professor of the, in the Department of Medicine at UCLA. In 2021, he was recruited to become the, the inaugural executive director of the Krenner Cardiovascular Research Center at the Cardiovascular Institute Indiana University School of Medicine. He has received multiple grants uh, from the NIH, including up to uh, $40 million in, in grants. Now moving to Dr. Kumar, who is a cardiologist and associate professor of medicine uh, and, uh, in, you know, in Ontario School of Medicine University. He's an attending cardiologist and the past chief of cardiology at Health Sciences North in Sudbury. He's an expert in cardiac imaging and the president of the Canadian Society of Cardiovascular MRI. Dr. Kumar trained in internal medicine in Berlin, Germany. He did his cardiology fellowship uh, at Quebec Heart and Lung Institute, and then a fellowship in cardiac MRI in Berlin, Germany, and in Calgary. He trained further and also in cardiac ultrasound in Toronto and went to LA for a fellowship in cardiac CT at Cedar sinai uh, his research focuses on heart attacks that he'll be talking about today, and he developed an imaging technique for bleeding into the heart muscle to image this bleeding using cardiac MRI, and we all read, read his publications. He has also been supported by a, a significant um, a number of grants from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, the Northern Ontario Academic <coughs> Medicine Association, and several others. It's a great pleasure to have you here today. So we'll be switching the presentations and then we'll have the QA at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Slipchuk, for this uh, very, very kind introduction. It's an honor to be here uh, with my colleague and friend, uh, Rohan Dharma Kumar from the Cranet Institute in Indiana. And we will be presenting the Canadian Cardiovascular Society classification of acute myocardial infarction. This is a new way of looking at myocardial infarction and classifying it according to the tissue damage that has occurred. The paper was... Uh, published recently in January in the Canadian Journal of Cardiology. This is the original um, publication that describes this new classification. It is endorsed by the Canadian Cardiovascular Society, and it, it is therefore the CCS classification. And it was then uh, published uh, again um, in the uh, European Heart Journal just a few weeks ago, as you mentioned. There's also a, a, an editorial by Dr. Deepak Bhatt in the Canadian Journal of Cardiology. I like to acknowledge that um, Rohan and I didn't do this all by ourselves. There's uh, a, fast, a fantastic team uh, behind it as, as always. And these are the co-authors that helped us uh, put this together. Rohan and I have been working on this for almost uh, 20 years now and uh, had um, significant um, uh, knowledge to contribute, especially in the field of reperfusion injury. These are our um, disclosures I do not see any conflict of interest. So uh, an overview of the CCS classification of acute atherothrombotic myocardial infarction. No MI remains one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality. And there's several ways actually of classifying uh, myocardial infarction with the Killip classification, Timmy risk scores, and so forth. Um, and all of them are super helpful, most helpful, the differentiation based on ECG, STEMI versus non-STEMI. 
Now, all of these scores do not take the tissue injury specifics into account, but we learned a lot about tissue injury in the past years. And the basic idea is if we take these tissue injuries and try to classify them, we can gain more information, which can then become important for patient care and for future research. So the new CCS classification of acute myocardial infarction now captures myocardial ischemia and reperfusion injury in a four-stage schematic, in a four-stage scale uh, that will facilitate patient care and research. So what is this about? These are the four stages. The very fundamental observation here that is underlying this new classification is that not all myocardial infarctions are the same, and tissue injury occurs in different stages and at every stage there's a very specific injury that's that gets added to the previous stage so the very first stage of acute myocardial infarction is aborted myocardial infarction if reperfusion therapy is provided early we will not have any significant cardiomyocyte necrosis at all so stage one aborted mi the injury that gets added at stage two is cardiomyocyte necrosis. When we move beyond aborted MI, there's myocardiomyocyte necrosis that occurs. Importantly, the microvessels are intact at this point. There's no microvascular injury yet because the microvessels have a higher ischemic threshold. At stage three, we have microvascular obstruction as the first sign of microvascular dysfunction occurring. And at stage four, we have microvascular disruption, which on reperfusion will lead to intramyocardial hemorrhage. So the four stages are aborted MI, stage two, cardiomyocyte necrosis, stage three, microvascular obstruction, and stage four. And with every stage four hemorrhagic MI, with every stage, there's one specific injury that gets added to the previous stage and that then becomes stage defining. This is a schematic that we showed, and it is reflecting a short axis of the left ventricle. At stage one, the tissue injury that occurs is myocardial edema, but there's no cardiomyocyte necrosis yet. At stage two, we have the wavefront of cardiomyocyte necrosis starting in the subendocardium, and then with time working its way across the subendocardium, and the myocardial infarct will become more and more transmural. We actually observe that microvascular obstruction and hemorrhage also fo follow a wavefront pattern. So microvascular obstruction will also start in the subendocardium first and then be more and more transmural. So this is stage three and stage four, then hemorrhagic MI hemorrhage also starting in the subendocardium and then becoming more and more transmural. With every stage, tissue injury becomes more and more severe. The body of literature strongly supports that there's a progressive loss of salvageable myocardium as we go down these stages. And therefore, the severity of tissue injury becomes more and more uh, important. The tissue injury becomes more and more severe. It culminates in hemorrhagic infarction um, at stage four, where there's with hemorrhage a added tissue injury that has a specific pathophysiology that we will talk about later. I'll start talking about stage one and stage two, and then I'll hand over to Dr. Dharma Kumar for stage three and stage four. So stage one, aborted myocardial infarction. There are specific diagnostic criteria that um, the, you know, the cardiology community and the guidelines have agreed upon. So it's more than 50% ST segment elevation um, after reperfusion 90 minutes post fibronolysis or 30 minutes post PCI. There's a lack of enzyme rise be below five times of normal. So the enzymes troponins does not go up more than five times upper limit of normal within 24 hours. There should be no Q waves, no sustained ST segment changes on the ECG after reperfusion. Coronary flow will be normal after PCI and no evidence for microvascular obstruction on angio contrast, echo, cardiac MRI, whatever method you use. Aborted MI occurs when we have very, very rapid reperfusion. The more time goes by, the less the likelihood will be of um, keeping the patient at stage one. The more time goes by, there's going to be a higher um, risk for cardiomyocyte necrosis because the uh, ischemic threshold will be surpassed. And there's been a whole 
um, body of literature studying aborted myocardial infarction, mostly at the time when thrombolysis um, became available. Multiple studies that can be mentioned here. Um, an interesting point that we like to make is with fibrinolysis, there's actually a higher rate of aborted MI uh, compared to PCI, probably because fibrinolysis gets administered a lot quicker than PCI because you just don't have a requirement for all this infrastructure. Um, this is a temporal analysis looking at fibrinolysis versus PCI, so more aborted MI with fibrinolysis versus PCI. This then translates into um, prognosis. So the prognosis of a patient with an aborted MI is much, much, much more favorable than a patient who has a further evolved MI with death, shock, heart failure, um, ranging up to half or less than half when MI is aborted. So this is stage one, aborted myocardial infarction. On the tissue level, we will see myocardial edema, but the importance is absence of significant cardiomyocyte necrosis. This is a schematic that we showed that, that um, shows the myocardial edema, but sustained viability of the cardiomyocytes. This injury is reversible. So these are the, oops, I'm sorry, these are the um, characteristics of aborted MI, injury is reversible, we have transient ischemic changes, troponin minimal elevation, normal coronary flow, absence of reperfusion injury. The next slide shows um, the increase in major adverse cardiovascular event rates. When we go beyond aborted MI, adverse event rate goes up two to 10 times. So the goal really is to keep the patient at the stage of aborted myocardial infarction. And this was uh, presented, this idea of keeping the patient at stage one, so to say, without using the nomenclature of CCS stage one, that was presented for the first time uh, in 2005. So aborted MI as a goal. When we go beyond aborted MI, we enter the stage two CCS, stage two myocardial infarction, which is cardiomyocyte necrosis. We have the classic definition here of a myocardial infarction. Uh, this is, so to say, your classical MI. So troponin levels go up. There are ECG changes. There is now loss of um, viable myocardium. The universal definition captures this uh, very well. There is a coronary thrombosis identified on coronary angiogram and imaging motion. methods usually show a regional wall motion abnormality. So we have cardiomyocyte necrosis now, this progressive irreversible loss of salvageable myocardium. Importantly, at stage two, no microvascular involvement. The microvessels are still intact. The infarct size that occurs is a independent predictor of outcome. Necrosis starts about one hour from onset of ischemia, troponins will become positive two to four hours after onset of ischemia. We have now uh, in our schematic, um, the edema that remains from stage one and the critical injury that gets added at CCS stage two is cardiomyocyte necrosis evolving as a wave front starting in the subendocardium and then extending transmurally. These are the diagnostic criteria. Um, so the patient can have Q waves, can have a STEMI or, or non-STEMI injuries now irreversible, troponin is elevated, um, this TIMI-3 flow post reperfusion, um, no, there can be a, a wall motion abnormality when the infarct is large enough, and the MRI will show late enhancement consistent with cardiomyocyte necrosis as well as edema. And we're now in a zone where uh, adverse event rates go up because we are no longer in that aborted MI zone. And I will now hand over to Dr. Dharma Kumar, who will talk about stage three and stage four. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Um, how do we switch? So at this point, I can share my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. Please. If you don't mind. Um, oh, here. Yes. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kumar and uh, Dr. Slipship for uh, um, inviting us for this talk. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about stage three and stage four, and these are um, really um, uh, important um, injuries that take place post uh, reperfusion. 
So uh, stage three, um, the hallmark injury here is microvascular obstruction, and it's identifiable uh, using several cardiac imaging techniques, including cardiac MRI, echo, and perhaps even uh, uh, coronary angiograms, PCI. So uh, the key takeaway here is that stage three portends uh, worsen cardiovascular outcomes when compared to stage one and stage two. So as the, Dr. Kumar mentioned, these injuries are uh, piling up uh, one on top of the other. So in stage two, you have edema and cardiomyocyte necrosis that have taken place. Stage three, we have uh, now microvasculature is engaged and we are uh, seeing microvascular obstruction. And, um, and this is, again, uh, occurring in this sort of wave pattern uh, moving from subendocardium uh, to the epicardium. Um, so what is microvascular obstruction? Many of you may know, but microvascular obstruction essentially is the microvasculature essentially gets plugged and impedes flow in very small vessels uh, uh, downstream to the epicardial coronary artery, despite the fact that you may have established a, um, a complete patency uh, of the epicardial uh, vessel that was once occluded. So here are the characteristics. Um, so the hallmark injury here is microvascular obstruction. The injury is irreversible. Uh, you would see possible persistence of ST elevation. Um, troponin is elevated and higher. Angiogram uh, will show reduced pulse reperfusion. Echocardiogram will show wall motion normality and reduced mitral perfusion and uh, worst LV function. On cardiac MRI, you will see motion abnormalities. Um, you will see edema um, with T2-based imaging. Late enhancement um, um, will show uh, with a, a central subendocardial sparing uh, that is indicative of uh, no reflow or microvascular obstruction. Um, so these are coronary angiograms, pre-PCI and post-PCI. On the left side is the pre-PCI, and you can see um, uh, the um, uh, the culprit artery um, that is not uh, perfusing well. And then post perfusion, post PCI here, you can see the flows established in that in, in the uh, in the lesions uh, cleared essentially, but you can see uh, that the downstream uh, vessel is still not perfusing um, as, as well as, say, for instance, in stage two. So there's a slow perfusion that's taking place there. Um, all right, so in cardiac MRI, you can very nicely visualize uh, microvascular obstruction. So you see the LGE as bright regions. So this, this is an example showing short and long axis views. And you can see the dark region with inside um, the infarct zone as um, uh, suggestive of microvascular obstruction. So if you take this one step further and you look at it on a muscle level, this is, uh, this is work that was done by Dr. Cloner, who's a pioneer in the area of reperfusion injury where you can see that this is, this is actually um, uh, animal models where we can see the occlusion uh, in, in panel A demonstrating that there is no flow, absolutely, but and reperfusion and thioflavin has stained that um, um, restricted flow uh, or no flow uh, um, exists in, in those images as well. So even though the coronary arteries, um, the epicardial coronary arteries are open, uh, you still have um, um, no flow in, in, the, in the microvascular beds. And this on the right side is a histological demonstration, again, demonstrating a blood, uh, blood flow in the microvascular beds. Okay, so uh, the key clinical outcomes here is that you no know, uh, no reflow typically occurs when MBO is large and not necessarily when, when it's small. And there is a whole grade of microvascular obstructions. The ones that we're talking about are the, are the more serious types here um, that leads to um, increased uh, risk uh, compared to even stage one and stage two. So um, if you look at the outcomes, essentially independent of what imaging method or uh, imaging method that you look at, uh, the outcomes are really bad. Um, and, and MACE um, risks are elevated in cases where you have microvascular obstruction than uh, if you don't. So uh, again, relative risk, um, as you move from stage one to stage, uh, stage one and two to stage uh, three and four, and three and four is, uh, you know, we can generally define as microvascular injury. Uh, and here the MACE risk is uh, amplified by a factor of two to four.
So now I'm going to talk about hemorrhagic infarction. And I just want to preface by saying hemorrhagic infarction is a fundamentally uh, a very uh, different pathophysiology that develops. Um, uh, in addition to all of these stages that we've seen with the development of edema and necrosis, microvascular obstruction, now we have hemorrhage. And uh, here we are going to see a significantly different pathophysiology and downstream consequences. So uh, again, um, compared to stage three, the hallmark injury is now micro, uh, myocardial hemorrhage that is taking place in the subendocardial. So what is it? So this is actually described uh, many decades ago by uh, Dr. Fishbane, Dr. Cloner, um, and uh, they've really demonstrated this in large animal models where you have um, not, not only an obstruction, but a microvascular destruction. So the small vessels are now bursting and they are extravasating red blood cells. So this is what this schematic actually captures. So you have uh, blood vessels, but they're also bursting and, and the red blood cells are going out. And there are very serious consequences associated with this. So if you look at it in cardiac MRI on long axis view here on LGE, you would see this, this what would look like a microvascular obstruction. You have this hypo intense zone uh, and within it, you have this very dark hypo, uh, sorry, hyper intense zone. And then within it, you will have a hypo intense zone uh, that is very visible. Now, if you did Peter star cardiac MRI, which is one of the uh, things that Dr. Uh, Kumar developed uh, now also about several years ago, um, what you will see pre-contrast pre -contrast T2 star images is that there is a signal loss in the region of infarct that you can characterize on the basis of LG ECMR. So um, that is an indication that is in fact hemorrhage. So one of the things that, you know, that, that's coming out here is that microvascular obstruction and hemorrhage actually occur together. So you could have microvascular obstruction without hemorrhage, but hemorrhage always happens with severe microvascular obstruction. So the characteristics uh, essentially are uh, of stage four is a hallmark injury is myocardial hemorrhage. Um, injury is definitely irreversible, but there are some important things that happen here, including infarct expansion, uh, delayed healing, uh, and downstream consequences, including fat infiltration, which I will talk about, which all of which actually um, are associated with risk of mechanical complications. Um, ECG, possible persistence of SD elevation, troponins elevated and then peaks higher, angiogram will again show reduced uh, flow, post perfusion, and echocardiogram will uh, similarly show uh, more extensive wall motion of malady and reduced myocardial perfusion and worst LV function. On cardiac MRI, the distinguishing feature uh, compared to uh, let's say stage three, is that not only you will see microvascular obstruction, but you will see uh, T2 star uh, uh, in uh, pre-contrast images uh, indicative of, um, of hemorrhage. So um, these are some of the data I wanted to show uh, on, on hemorrhagic infarction are as follows. So one of the things that we demonstrated in 2002 in the Jack paper is that um, there is a very important uh, uh, difference in troponin kinetics uh, post-PCI, um, and it's, it's, it peaks higher and, uh, and earlier in hemorrhagic infarction than in non-hemorrhagic infarction, and, and the scar sizes are significantly higher in these patients than uh, those without uh, hemorrhage, but could have microvascular obstruction. So we, did, we went on to do studies to really validate this, this uh, what is actually going on. So one of the things that, that the troponin kinetics was telling us is that potentially there's something fundamentally different about hemorrhagic infarction in the sense that the troponin, post pci troponins are peaking uh, earlier and higher. So uh, here uh, we've done, we did large animal studies where we were able to demonstrate that independent of area at risk um, uh, that you see with the PET images on the top, uh, in the that in the images on LGE images uh, demonstrated to us that if you were to do these studies in a very time resolved manner, you can actually see the infarct expansion taking place. And what's actually captured here is exactly that as an aggregate data uh, across the animals that were hemorrhagic and non-hemorrhagic. Um, and you, you what what I want to uh, point out here is that um, within the first 24 hours you have an incredible increase in, in infarct size. Now notice that this is normalized the area at risk. So the area at risk is the same 
The ischemia time is the same, but post reperfusion, you have a fundamentally different evolution that is taking place in, in hemorrhagic infarction that you don't necessarily see in non hemorrhagic infarction. So, what's happening here is that after reperfusion, you have a, a, an extensive uh, um, uh, infarct expansion that uh, is really. Uh, you know, uh, abolishing the benefits of reperfusion therapy in uh, significantly reducing uh, the salvaged myocardium, or at least one's thought to be salvaged. And, and essentially, you're getting to be a, uh, you know, getting an infarct that is capturing almost the entire area at risk. And so that's what this, um, I mean, part of this data here is to demonstrate one is that the area at risk here on these studies that we did in large animals essentially is there is no difference uh, in, uh, in area at risk. And then what we wanted to do was that we wanted to uh, allow for resolution of things like edema and, uh, and, and size of heart and things like this. And so what we show here is that the scar size in hemorrhagic infarcts and non-hemorrhagic infarcts are uh, twofold different. And um, this, is, this is remarkable because, you know, we, we're starting with, same area at risk, same ischemia time, yet uh, the outcomes are fundamentally uh, different when it comes to scar size. And the other matter is that, that, so all of this is happening in the acute phase. And then when you look at it in the chronic phase, there are um, significant uh, issues that are taking place here as well. And this, this allows us to conclude that uh, not all chronic infarctions are the same. So let me just walk you through, this is a busy slide. But what I wanted to uh, uh, point to you is that in hemorrhagic infarcts, what happens is that, it, it, you know, if you look at the pearl stain, the last panel on the right, is that in, uh, after several, uh, uh, several weeks, and this is uh, large animal models, again, this is histological uh, studies that we did, and when you look at this, you, you start to see an accumulation of iron with inside the infarct zone uh, that you don't see in non-hemorrhagic infarcts. So the blue dots here are essentially essentially the, the iron deposits, and, and you don't see that in non-hemorrhagic infarcts. So well, what does that even mean? Does it even matter? Well, those, 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 these are studies that we continue to do over a couple of decades now, where we were able to demonstrate that this de deposition of iron is also um, connected to a prolonged inflammatory burden, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, L1, beta, TNF alpha, MMP9 are all activated in these regions. And this uh, is, you know, the take, take home message from this is that the, 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 the more iron you have, in other words, the larger the hemorrhage, uh, and that results into these iron depositions, the greater the amount of um, inflammation, uh, pro-inflammatory burden that is taking place. So essentially, these hemorrhagic infarcts don't necessarily heal as well as the non-hemorrhagic infarcts and, and, and the in, uh, delay, um, sorry, the, the um, uh, the healing is significantly delayed. And another thing that happens is that if you let this go for a period of time, and again, a lot of the data that I'm presenting on the histology is essentially all large animal models, what you find is that I, you know, at eight week old infarcts, you're starting to see these, these white globules and the, those are fat. And this is work that we've actually published in Nature Communications a couple of years ago. And what we see is that iron actually drives a, um, uh, a, a process where the fibrotic tissue actually becomes replaced with uh, fatty infiltrate. So if you go from eight weeks to uh, six months, you'll see that the, the white globules are actually overtaking. And you can see uh, on the middle, middle uh, panel here uh, on, the, on the right side, you can see that they're co-localized with, with iron. So iron is actually, I don't want to go into all the details here, but iron is really driving a, a process of uh, lipomatous metaplasia here uh, within inside the infarct zone. And this is data. Um, now we are able to do this in, in, in human subjects. And this, this is early data that's not actually published. What we're seeing here is that in these hemorrhagic MI patients uh, versus non-hemorrhagic MI patients, that there's significant elevation of, of fat that's uh, seen uh, when you follow them up at six months. And that's what's shown. Uh, on this panel, uh, particularly with the, the, the red, red uh, bar here. And this PDF is the proton density fraction. And what we also see is that the iron concentration doesn't reduce, but the fat infiltration actually increases. And so you might wonder, well, how long is this iron deposit that's actually uh, in the heart? Well, 
Uh, we were uh, the first to demonstrate that it lasted six months, but this is a, a, a beautiful study that is coming out of Germany, uh, this published in Jack Imaging a couple of years ago that shows that if you had a hemorrhagic infarction, the chances of uh, you having these iron deposits uh, uh, lasting in your heart is that it, it could be as long as a decade. So it's not sitting there uh, by itself and uh, it's actually driving other uh, fundamental physiological processes that are deleterious. So um, this is now coming to uh, just outcomes. Uh, this is early work that was uh, uh, done in Calgary when I, uh, uh, Dr. Isle was there. And he demonstrated that if you had various different characteristics with inside the infarcts, then your, uh, the rate, uh, the, the cumulative MACE rate actually goes up. So um, if you had hemorrhagic infarcts, obviously you have the greatest uh, uh, um, risk for these major adverse cardiovascular events. And that is diminished when you go into uh, cases where you have microvascular obstruction, but no hemorrhage. And then later still, if you have no microvascular obstruction, no hemorrhage, then your risks are significantly lower. And you can see this stepping up, right? Now, based on this classification scheme that we've uh, talked about here, uh, uh, what we see is that we can, we can redefine these sort of categories that he classified earlier as the following. So, uh, this, the, the lower case is CCS uh, AMI stage one and two. And then the next step is stage three, where you have microvascular obstruction, but no hemorrhage. And then stage four, you have microvascular obstruction and hemorrhage. So this, this, is, this is around 400 patients that were studied and, uh, and followed up for about uh, six months or so. Now, uh, there are studies that, uh, you know, a related group out of Germany uh, has published very recently, and that also shows very similar outcomes. Now patients are followed for uh, 12 months. And I think there are studies that are coming out that are going to be following patients for about 10 years with very similar risks uh, in hemorrhagic cases versus non-hemorrhagic cases. So, and there are other issues associated with this too. You know, when you look at electrical anomalies and VTVF and sudden cardiac death in patients post MI, there are some important implications that hemorrhage holds here as well. And uh, Mather's group out of, um, sorry, Mather uh, and others um, out of the UK uh, published in 2012 of increased uh, risk for electrical activities in patients who have hemorrhagic infarcts. And we published this very similar data. Um, in, uh, you know, if you're looking at uh, prognostic information in particular electrical anomalies, here we, we demonstrate very similar things that if you have hemorrhagic uh, insult to the myocardium in the early phases, then you're also running into big problems with electrical activities down, uh, down the road. And these are, this is patient data. So uh, I wanna close by saying, now we are looking at these stages and comparing to just hemorrhagic infarction. And uh, the hemorrhagic infarction is the microvascular destruction. And when you're looking at the MACE risk here, now compared to all the other cases, we have even greater uh, risk of uh, two to six fold uh, in terms of major adverse cardiovascular events. And I'm going to stop there and pass this over to Dr. Kumar. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tarman Kumar. And I will uh, continue with some quick case examples. And... Um, I think you should be able to see my slides. Yes, we can. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes. Yes, okay, thank you. So uh, some case examples, CCS stage one, two, four. These are um, MRI images. So on the panel uh, on the left, a CCS stage one myocardial infarction. Uh, this is a patient who had an anterior STEMI. Uh, there is actually no late enhancement on late enhancement imaging. T2 star for hemorrhage is, uh, is normal. So this is a lucky patient who walked away after an ST elevation MI due to a very brief uh, period of ischemia and a quick door to balloon time with no significant injury. At stage two, uh, we have cardiomyocyte necrosis occurring. This is an anterior septal STEMI patient this is a short axis of the left ventricle on late enhancement. You can see the necrosis here. Importantly, there's no microvascular injury. 
that you can see the wall motion on the cine image in the two chamber view down here. And again, a homogeneous signal on T2 star, so no hemorrhage. Stage three now is a different patient that had an inferior STEMI. You can see normal signal in a septum, anterior wall, anterior lateral wall. The late enhancement then shows an increased signal, a late enhancement from about seven o'clock to five o'clock here. This is an inferior transmural MI. And in the subendocardium, and almost transmural in this case, is a black signal uh, contrast void, which is caused by microvascular obstruction. So contrast is not penetrating this area because of microvascular obstruction. This is CCS stage three with microvascular obstruction. Uh, the T2 star shows no uh, signal dropped in that area, so no hemorrhage here. And on the right panel, you have a patient with a massive uh, anterior septal MI. The entire septum and a large part of the anterior wall is um, involved here, and the black void in the septum is a massive area of microvascular obstruction. This patient on T2 star has a massive area of signal drop here, um, signal bleed into the myocardium. This is hemorrhagic myocardial infarction, CCS stage four. So the um, CCS classification of acute MI, the basic information that we are providing with the classification is that not all myocardial infarctions are the same. Right now, we're diagnosing them all the same and the tissue injuries are not really taken into account very much. And the CCS classification allows us to capture the information from tissue injury and translate it into the clinical setting. It can help us with risk stratification, and it can help us to provide tissue injury targets for future research. Not all myocardial infarctions are the same. And if we start taking the tissue injury into account, then we may be in a position to develop better therapies in the future. With each stage, Tissue injury becomes more and more severe. The eligible myocardium with each stage, there's a specific injury that gets added. And as Dr. Dharma Kumar so eloquently uh, laid out, there's an added injury with hemorrhage occurring in hemorrhagic infarction, CCS stage four, that then leads to a very specific pathophysiology with infarct expansion, a specific inflammatory pathway that gets uh, triggered and then fatty degeneration of the scar. This is all important because with each stage, the prognosis of the patient gets worse and worse and worse and worse. So moving from an aborted MI to a more involved, evolved myocardial infarction, the event rate goes up two to 10 times. When you go from a stage two cardiomyocyte necrosis, no microvascular injury, further to a my, a patient that has microvascular injury of some sort, the patient has, again, a two to four time increase in the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events. And when you compare hemorrhagic to non-hemorrhagic MI, the hemorrhagic MI patients have a two to six time increase in major adverse cardiovascular events. And the incidences of these tissue injuries are displayed um, below. And uh, there's a, a wide range here a little bit because uh, this is data captured from several clinical studies, but hemorrhagic MI is about 25 to 40% of all patients. A, a straight necrotic MI, no microvascular injury is about 30 to 50%. And microvascular obstruction, no hemorrhage is about 40 to 50%. It really depends on what imaging method was used to diagnose and what, was, what exactly was the patient population. Now, there are some factors that have been uh, identified to be associated with injury progression. We call this figure the injury clock, and this is from the Canadian Journal of Cardiology, uh, January edition, the original publication of the paper. So risk factors that are associated with further and further progression of the injury are longer delay to reperfusion, longer duration of ischemia, cigarette smoking, a worse killip class, worse Timmy risk score, worse coronary perfusion before a reperfusion, worse perfusion after reperfusion, um, larger area at risk, and uh, LAD territory more often than non-LAD territory. I'd like to emphasize what Dr. Dharma Kumar briefly mentioned. There are 
um, two or three very good pathology studies looking at large case samples. And when we look at mechanical complications, which are you know, the dreaded complication of myocardial infarction with septal wall rupture, free wall rupture, um, which are almost invariably associated with sudden death, these uh, mechanical complications are very closely associated with hemorrhagic myocardial infarction. We postulate that there is um, pressure building up in, in the tissue and then the hemorrhage um, will lead to mechanical instability of the tissue and then to myocardial rupture. Now, we have to mention some limitations of this new classification. First of all, it applies to atherothrombotic myocardial infarction only. This classification does not apply to other types of MI, such as embolic MI or myocardial infarction from coronary vasospasm and uh, demand supply mismatch, for example. So it's a typical um, a, a type one myocardial infarction according to the universal definition. All the research that was used to establish this classification was based on patients that had reperfused myocardial infarction. So the classification may or may not apply to non-reperfused. We just don't know because there's no data. And right now is the four requires cardiac MRI for diagnosis. However, I'd like to mention that um, we just uh, published two days ago an abstract at the CRT conference uh, showing that troponin kinetics can be exploited to uh, get an idea whether or not hemorrhage is uh, present. So maybe uh, we will see blood markers in the future. Now, the clinical translation, um, is this important? Yes. Uh, right now, this can be applied in the clinical setting uh, as a risk stratification tool. So uh, the worst demonstrable injury will, uh, will determine the CCS infarct stage. We made this statement because sometimes you have contradicting information. The interventionalist will tell you, I got Timmy 3 flow after the PCI, but when you do an MRI, you will actually see microvascular obstruction. So we suggest that the clinic clinicians take all available data into account and determine the CCS infarct stage based on the worst observed tissue injury. Now, a viable comment that will be made is that not all patients will get an MRI. So in some patients, we will just not know whether hemorrhage occurred or not. Um, so if a complete data set is not available, we're suggesting that a plus sign in brackets would be added after the CCS stage. For example, you could state that your patient had an acute STEMI CCS stage 2 plus, and this means that stage 2 was validated based on the data that is available, but microvascular obstruction and hemorrhage were not assessed, therefore CCS stage 2 plus. And the plus would fall off if a complete data set, including MRI, was actually acquired. Importantly, the CCS classification does not replace other classifications. We absolutely recognize the tremendous clinical value that um, is brought to the clinical uh, stage with you know, the clinic, the KILIP classification, the heart score, all the other scores that are available. Everything has its place. Um, but we do believe that the tissue injury-based classification will make an important contribution because it captures the very fundamental pathophysiology in an easy, uh, easy, easily applicable four-stage schematic. What we're really excited about is the research translation. As I mentioned, the four stages really show us that, the, that there's four different types of injury, four stages of severity. And when you look at the tissue injury using MRI, using pathology, it is absolutely evident that not all myocardial infarctions are the same. Yet today, we're treating them all as if they were the same. Now, we believe that if we, if we take this tissue injury into account, then the hypothetical best therapy would actually depend on the tissue injury. So the future hypothetical best therapy for a patient with a stage four MI is probably completely different from the best hypothetical therapy that a stage one or stage two MI would need. And we already know that the stages define outcome measures. So if we develop therapies specifically for stage three or specifically for stage four, and we can dial down the impact of adverse prognosis, uh, then we can probably make a huge impact for our patients. So research can be improved by taking the CCS stages into account. And also the CCS stage 
stages could be used as a as outcome targets in pharmaceutical research, interventional research, health systems research. So if you're doing whatever kind of interventions to target myocardial infarction, um, you may be able to register a benefit of therapy or the measures that you're applying, that you're testing. You could um, register a benefit if you're starting to see less CCH stage four, less CCS stage three, and you're able to, to provide cardio protection and keep the injury at stage one or stage two. So I like to um, wrap up and, and to summarize the CCS classification of acute atherothrombotic MI captures the severity of uh, tissue injury in ischemia and reperfusion injury in an easily applicable four-stage schematic. This can be used for refined patient risk assessment in clinical care. This provides tissue injury outcome measures for research. It will allow us to, allow us to refine uh, the outcome measures for research. And we believe that the stages are now providing targets for the development of future tissue-directed therapies, which will allow us in the future to provide more personalized care, more tissue injury-directed care, better care for our patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this wonderful lecture. I really appreciate the, the time for both of you joining us. Uh, we'll have, uh, please put your, your questions in, in the Q&A. Uh, we have also Dr. Garcia joining us for, for this Q&A session. Uh, Dr. Garcia, if you want to start with the, the first question, and you have there the, the CME code, if, if you want to, please, uh, it's, it's on the screen right now. Thank you very much, Alejandro, and thank you, Dr. Kumar and Dr. Kumar. Um, uh, very, very uh, fascinating presentation and, and, and a novel way of looking at um, uh, risk stratification in, in, in MI patients. I am curious about um, uh, two things. Um, one is um, why um, you did not um, include at all any measurement of infar size in terms of number of segments um, involved uh, in the classification as uh, we know that also number of segments uh, can have a significant prognostic um, uh, in importance in, in these patients. And the second question is, what is the appropriate timing to do the MRI? If um, done too early, uh, gadolinium enhancement can um, overestimates the size of the scar and 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 be more reflective of uh, of the area of edema uh, whereas uh, it's been shown that you know over time when repeated uh, the MRI shows that the, the actual area of the of the scar is smaller great um Rohan, is it okay if I take this question? Yeah, you take it and then I can maybe add yeah. so uh, the first question regarding to the infarct segments, um, it is very, very well established, as, as you mentioned, um, that infarct size is a predictor of outcome. The larger the infarct, the worse the outcome is going to be. Um, we are actually um, mentioning infarct size as a predictor of outcome. The uh, important information here, though, is that the moment microvascular injury occurs, uh, adverse event rates go up independent of infarct size. So no matter if the infarct is small or large, the moment that you observe microvascular obstruction, um, the the uh, prognostic um, the prognosis of the patient goes goes down. And this is very impressive data. And actually, in some MRI studies, the amount of microvascular obstruction that was observed was minimal. It was just a few grams of tissue, but already immediately led to this adverse uh, prognosis. Um, analyzing infarct size in segments is another way of looking at infarct size, but it's absolutely recognized that, that uh, larger infarcts are associated with more adverse outcomes. But reperfusion injury is independent um, and, and, and stepwise. So hemorrhage, again, independent of microvascular obstruction to predict adverse outcome. The second question, timing of the study. Um, so the uh, infarct expansion will 48 to 72 hours after 
uh, reperfusion. Um, ideally, we would want to wait uh, the 72 hour window to see the complete acute injury. So the best timing um, probably is to do an MRI three to seven days out after the myocardial infarction. And there's a bit of a lack of, of information in this window, seven days to four to six weeks, and a lot of studies then uh, captured data in, in that time. But we suggest to get the MRI about three days after reperfusion injury. After, uh, sorry, after reperfusion therapy for the STEMI, for the MI. Yeah, I'll, uh, thank you, Andreas. Um, I'll just add a couple of points. Um, so I, I also, like Dr. Kumar, agree on the infarct size, and this has been studied for a long, long time. We all know the adverse outcomes associated with uh, increasing infarct size. So there's no question about that. But I think one thing that we want to keep in mind here is that, you know, when you look at 5% LV mass of infarct size versus 15% uh, of LV mass, it's just LV mass that, you know, the amount of infarct, scar tissue, that's what you're looking at. But what these classific this classification does is that it starts to introduce pathophysiological concepts that were not super embedded on top of its infarct size. So if you had an infarct size, let's say 15% versus a 15% infarct size with hemorrhage, there are fundamentally different pathophysiology that is taking place that is driving these things in the background. So the question is, is it infarct size that's driving the outcomes or is it infarct size in addition to these additional pathophysiological phenomena like inflammatory processes and fat filtration, et cetera, that are driving out? So that I think is going to be the most exciting thing that we're going to be able to study in the time to come. And then um, the, the second question I just wanted to add there, you know, uh, a, a large group of us uh, wrote a expert consensus paper um, that is published in JAC in 2015 uh, on what are the best time points for imaging various different um, types of infarcts. I mean, this character classification didn't exist at that time, of course, but it does outline what are the best uh, times to image. So that's really exactly what uh, Kumar said is typically about three to five days post uh, PCI. Thank you very much for, for those answers, uh, very enlightening for us. So we have a, a few questions. I'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, we have first one by Purvi Parwani that you mentioned a little bit before. She's asking, what is the strongest predictor of progression within stages? You've shown some of the different LAD smoking, some of these uh, patterns, but which one is the strongest? And also just combine it with another question, uh, so what, what about therapeutics? There has been some association with 2B3A, and some people have tried to study colchicine for this inflammatory effect on, on hemorrhage, but what, what, uh, what is your input on that? Yeah. Um, do you want me to take this quickly, Andres, or? As, as you, you want. want. Yeah, yeah, I'll just, and then you can add it. Um, yeah. so, so colchicine is very interesting, right? So uh, colchicine... Uh, it's an anti-inflammatory, um, and it could potentially be very interesting to look at that hemorrhagic infarction. So these classifications, this classification scheme is important because it now allows us to look at these, uh, you know, look at therapies and define them uh, according to the characteristics, the unplanned characteristics of the patients. So um, uh, that is not the end, right? Of course, colchicine is going to reduce the inflammation, but what we are doing is we're running a clinical trial right now on using uh, deferic prone, uh, and it's uh, and it's on clinicaltrials.gov. We started this. This this is a process where we're looking at the chronic facts and removing those iron deposits that take place. Um, uh, and this is this is a pilot trial that is is taking place, and hopefully we'll be able to report back uh, in in a bit of time about what the outcomes of those patients are. Go ahead, Andres. If I can quickly uh, weigh in, so. The strongest predictors of um, of a, a progression of the injury is probably the duration of ischemia together with the size of the area at risk. Uh, this is why we put it into the injury clock. So the more um, the clock ticks, the more wave fronts will start in the subendocardium and lead to additional uh, tissue damage. Um, the strongest predictors are time to reperfusion, um, infarct size, or uh, area at risk. And uh, and LAD 
more frequently than than other um, coronary arteries involved. In terms of therapy, it's it's fascinating and there's a lot of thoughts out there, but we have to say clearly that for reperfusion injury, there's at this time no established therapy. So there were studies with GP2B3A antagonists adenosine, nicorandil, other therapies that showed that you may be able to angiograph angiographically, angiographically sorry, um, improve coronary flow, but these studies all failed to show a sustained prognostic benefit for our patients. So it is not, it's not established, we do not have an established therapy for ischemia and reperfusion injury in terms of microvascular obstruction and hemorrhage yet. But we do hope that with the CCS classification, we're shifting the focus and bringing a schematic that will actually allow us to, to capture the tissue injury and revive our interest in, in tissue injury directed therapies. Thank you very and much. I'll just quickly add that uh, CCS, uh, one of the things that Dr. Kumar mentioned earlier is that not all myocardial infarctions are the same. So the therapies going you know, at various different stages should also be different. And we have not done a good enough job in terms of you know, looking at therapy that are targeted at these different stages. So I think that is going to be something that is going to hopefully evolve based on these classifications. Thank you very much. And another great point from Purvi, uh, she mentioned, so some of the factors that affect the classification, we expect that they will be there for a long time, like LGE, but uh, what about the, the time variability of other uh, MRI uh, sequences like T2-weighted imaging or the, the time that the hemorrhage persists there or the changes? In particular, she asked about the T2-weighted imaging when it persists and how it affects your therapies. Yeah, so T2, so we want to make sure, I think, um, that these are pathophysiology. It really is driven by pathophysiology. Imaging is a way to identify the type of injury that's taking place, whether it's T2 or T2 star or LG or whatever else it is. So that's first. Second, as we know, there's always lots of development that take place that characterize various different things. We have a paper that is essentially going to come out pretty soon in Jack Imaging that tell us that if you go to 3T, you can use T2 to look at hemorrhage equally as well as you can do it with T2 star at 1. So that doesn't change the underlying pathophysiology. Pathophysiology is intact. The, the, the methods that we use to, use to measure them and identify them, that can also evolve and from not only including CMR, but ECHO and various other imaging modalities that can potentially give a lot of the same information. Thank you very much. Uh, and we have a question that is common between Daniel Lorenzati and, and Danny Sims. They ask, so in this uh, stage one of aborted right, myocardial infarction, uh, you've mentioned troponin I. How, how does this change with the high sensitivity troponin? This is a fantastic question. So we were, when we wrote this, uh, this expert recommendation paper, we were actually struggling with this a little bit. Um, because the, so the, we used the common definition of aborted myocardial infarction as it is being used in the clinical trials. Um, the, uh, the challenge really is, and, and again, that would be uh, for aborted MI, a um, elevation of troponin that stays below five times the upper limit of normal. Now with progressively sensitive troponin tests, especially with a high sensitivity troponin, the troponin goes up very, very fast. And sometimes we have significant troponin elevations and we do not see any significant necrosis on, on cardiac MRI. So we believe that right now we're using the definition of aborted MI as it is already established in the cardiovascular community and, and, and in the guidelines. But we had a discussion with the expert team and we decided to actually create an expert group, a working group on the def definition of myocardial infarction and troponin rise is something that we will be revisiting. I believe personally, that's not the opinion of the society or that's my personal opinion. I believe that the troponin 
um, measures are too aggressive and we need to be a little more lenient with a troponin to identify aborted uh, MI. The question now is where do you want to draw the line with what assay at, at, at what level? So it's a bit more complex. Uh, but I absolutely agree with this thought that you can have a significant troponin elevation, especially with high sensitivity. And when you look at M with MRI, there's really not much necrosis or even no necrosis there. Thank you very much. Uh, a question more technical from Neil Lorenzati. Uh, should we use uh, T2-weighted imaging or native T1 mapping uh, in self-dedicated T2 star for detecting hemorrhagic MI? Can we use it or do we always need to do T2 star? Okay, I can comment on that. Um, so we have a paper that is actually coming out that will compare these T1, T2, T2 star methods. Um, at this point, I would like to say that T2 star is the, is, is the go-to method for hemorrhagic infarction. It's not that T1 and T2 doesn't pick it up, but there are confounders associated with T1 and T2 that would complicate, uh, you know, catching all the hemorrhagic infarction. So T2 star is by far the best. Now, T2 at 3T seems to, seems to provide equivalent information as T2 star, but there is a very tight time frame in which you need to catch. It's typically about three to five days post PCI. That is actually okay, provided you're doing this. If you do it in, you know, earlier than that, later than that, things might look quite different. So um, it's not these other methods, um, you know, there, there's other methods like diffusion weighted imaging and all the different things that are evolving as well. QSM is another method that's evolving, but those are, um, those are up the horizon. But if you want, you know, clinically speaking, if you want to look at hemorrhagic infarction, uh, I think the T2 star is, is still the best, particularly because a lot of people are still running on pin t or CMR. Okay, thank you very much. I think we'll, we'll end it now. There are five minutes uh, later, but this was fantastic. Thank you very much, and we're looking forward to your next papers on the topic. Thank you for having us.